it's my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Richard Danielpour, a highly celebrated, sought after, magnificent, living American composer, uh, a treasure with us. And he's here on the occasion of uh, us getting to experience this, this marvelous string quintet of his, uh, subtitled A Shattered Vessel. And I can't think of a finer opportunity than to have the actual composer here to speak with, to give us a little bit of insight into this work. And Richard, we're just so, uh, so pleased that you could arrange to spend a little bit of time with us. Thank you, Kai. And, uh, and thank you also for having me, particularly in this time when I believe that music is needed now more than ever. Um, you know, we, are, we, have been, we have been forced to be distant from one another, which is an unnatural thing for human beings. Yes. And, and music, even with distance, shows us that we are, not, we are not separate. We are not separated because in the sharing of these tones, we can remember once again that we are part of one human family. And that family is the human race. Uh, Chamber Music Monterey Bay was one of the several co-commissioners of this work. Uh, my understanding that is that you composed it in uh, 2018. It was premiered in 2019. And then here in 2020, we're going to enjoy a, a live performance. Um, tell us, if you will, let's start with, with the commission. Um, what were the sort of parameters and the constraints of the commission? And you had told me something about writing a string quintet with two celli, a so-called cello quintet. Tell us a little bit about that, too. Well, yeah, 30 years ago, um, a little over 30 years ago, in uh, <clears throat> the end of 1988 or, or middle of 1988, the Chamber Music so Society of Lincoln Center approached me to write a piece for the Emerson Quartet, where, which was the resident quartet of the society at the time with another cellist. So they said, would you write a cello quintet? And I said, and I was at the time 33 years old. Um, I was, you know, I was out of Juilliard, but I was having lessons. Whenever I would finish a piece, I would bring my music to Leonard Bernstein, who literally lived across the street from where I lived in the Dakota in New York. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, at 33, I knew that, you know, with the, with the Schubert Quintet, which is one of, the, one of the arguably most perfect works ever written, kind of like looming, you know, in my brain and, and, and sort of standing on my shoulder, I knew that at that age, I wasn't ready to write it, right? And I, so I said, you know, give me another 30 years. I can and then in 2018, I remember talking to Ida Kavafian saying, you know, years ago, the Chamber Music Society asked me to write a cello quintet. Um, and, I, and I knew I wasn't ready, but you know, I think I might be ready to do it now. And um, she got back to me a few months later and she said, you know, I think it's time for you to do it too. We'd like to commission you. Um, we'd like to be the lead commissioner at Angel Fire and it's going to be an anniversary year, she said, for her, and um, it would be appropriate, and uh, they'll, they'll try to do it with the Schubert Quintet on the second half of the program. So I thought, great. And I decided that for the year 2018 and probably part of 2019, I would write only chamber music. Uh -huh. So this was one of a few works that I wrote that were basically for smaller numbers of players. Um, but, but this was an important thing for me to do because it was something I'd been waiting to do for 30 years. Absolutely, and I, I yeah, it reminds me of that expression, an overnight success takes 10 years. Well, here, the overnight success took 30. And I'm so pleased that after 30 years of experience as a composer, and more, of course, that uh, it, it came around again, and here you are, and here you will share the program with the Schubert Quintet, so you're, you're in great company in addition to having your own fine work. As I was writing this, I just had a sense of, of urgency that something terrible was about to happen. 
this is, keep in mind, this is the summer of 2018. And I just had this feeling in my gut and I didn't want to hold it in my gut because I didn't, I wasn't interested in an ulcer. So yeah. what I did instead was I put this into the music that I was writing. Um, and I didn't really understand what a shattered vessel meant, but I knew that what I was writing about was that, you know, whether we're, we deal with this individually or collectively, that there are periods when things fall apart, as the phrase from Yeats' second coming goes. That's where the, the title of the first I, movement I was from. thinking that because it's such a powerful expression. And, uh, and, that I this... set, and I set that poem in Songs of Solitude, which I wrote right after 9-11 uh, um, for Thomas Hampson. And, uh, you know, the second, the second movement, which is, I, I believe, uh, titled, and the titles are always at the end of the piece. I, well, I, was, I wanted to ask you about that. Sorry, to, I didn't want to interrupt your story there, but it reminded me of, say, Debussy and his preludes or or even uh, Schumann, who said the titles came after. Is this your, your feeling? That somehow the they're title, parenthetical? The titles came as I was writing, but I, I put the titles at the end because I don't want people limited by the titles. I want them just to listen. Yeah. And I think that's the same reason Debussy wrote, you know, for instance, if Debussy had titled that particular prelude on the front of the first page, The Girl with the Flaxen Hair, you know, yeah. all anybody would be thinking about was some beautiful blonde, right? <laughs> but, no, but you're absolutely right. You're right. You understand what I'm saying? And 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 I'm not being sexist or anything. I'm just I'm no, saying no, no. that people would be limited. People would be limited in their appreciation to just listen. You know, sometimes just lit. You know, in order to be even a halfway decent composer, you have to be a great listener. <laughs> you know. And, and in order to be even an adequate teacher, you have to be a phenomenal listener. To, yeah. be a, 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 to, to be even a serviceable mentor, you have to be a phenomenal listener. So in that way, I just, I want people to listen. I don't want people to, 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 to create thoughts about the thing. I want yes. them to pick in the thing itself, you know? The thing in itself, yes. As Wallace That's Stevens says. Which is, which is why the titles are at the end. But the titles are nonetheless important because they're a roadmap for this trajectory of going from, going from uh, a kind of brokenness yeah. to a place of mourning, which is what the second movement is about. The second movement is incredibly vulnerable. It's very, very tender and vulnerable as in, as if, you know, it's like there's no armor on the second movement. Mm. And that's why I called it Harvest of Sorrows. Yeah, and talk about the word harvest, because I, I, that caught, again, not to overly emphasize your titles, but um, I thought Harvest of Sorrows was very, very poetic and provocative. Well, it's because when, when something terrible happens, either as it's going on right now, right? Yeah. What, what, what happens is we become vulnerable. We become raw. We are forced to become raw. And it's not convenient to be raw, right? Nobody likes to we be- We avoid it generally as much as possible. We wear as much armor as we possibly can to avoid being raw, to avoid being on the verge of tears, to avoid being at the point where we just are brought to our knees, right? Yeah. But there's a point where many of us at different times in our life have been brought to our knees. And it's not the worst thing on earth because it makes us more human. And I believe in some ways it, 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 uh, it, it enlightens that, what Bernstein used to refer to as the pilot light in all of us. It, it, it sort of wakes up that light, that divine energy that's with, within each of us to join forces with our human nature in yeah. bringing out yeah. the very best in us. This pandemic, interestingly enough, as you well know, has brought out both the best in people and the worst in people. Oh. Americans are, are showing how strong they are. Yeah. Um, I mean, the world is showing its strength, really. That's right. We have no choice, right? We have no choice. And that's really the point. 
um, when things fall apart yeah. and we welcome that sort of blossoming of sorrow, right? Yes. We embrace our sadness. We embrace the mourning. Um, the only thing left to do is pick ourselves up and begin the process of healing, which is what the third movement is about. It's called the healing fields. And it's about the, the reinvigoration of our energies in order to bring about the healing, the reparation, the consolation yeah. that is necessary to put things back together, yeah. um, to put ourselves back together. You know, um, if I could say too, uh, the, and this third movement is it's very much of a joyful uh, scherzo. I mean, it's kind of, it's really a celebration, right? Yes. And vitality reemerges. In other words, what it is, is, it's, is it is, it is, and this is something I was very conscious of as I was writing it, Kai. It is that it is a conscious decision yeah. to choose life rather than death. It is a conscious decision to embrace life in spite of its sadness, to embrace life in spite of its broken heartedness at times. Yes. You know, Let's come back to the fourth movement now. Uh, and just to complete this wonderful dramatic arc, we've had the healing fields, which we talked about this um, willing, you know, seizing life. Uh, choosing life over death amidst all the challenges because it's so easy to give up in some ways. The last movement, you've uh, used the subtitle Homeward. And one of the things that struck me about this quintet that makes it quite unique, I feel like, I mean, we have a four movement layout. One could you know, certainly talk about the middle movements, the slow movement of scherzo. But here we have what is, to use a cliched phrase, the heart of the matter, the, the, That's you know, right. the really center of gravity. And unusual for a work, in a sense, is kind of slow, it's profound, it's the longest movement, and it's the end. Um, it's, I was trying to think of how I would describe it, because I've, I'm already addicted to it. I feel like it's music I could comfortably live within forever. Thank because, you. Uh, I mean, it even reminds me, if you'll forgive it, I, I sometimes hate comparisons, but it reminds me a little bit of, of Beethoven's Heiliger Dankesang. Yes, 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 yes. That's exactly... That's exactly what I think of it as being related to. Oh, and it's and there are there are reasons because, why I say that. But tell me, tell me. So tell me about this movement. What were you thinking about homeward? And then how does how does a, a mortal write a piece of music like this? How did this come out of you? Uh, well, first of all, you know I don't know how it works. I but as I've gotten older, I feel more and more that I'm a kind of and I don't. And this is not. I'm not, you know, this is not a hokey, I'm trying not to be like hokey or corny, but I feel more and more as I get older, and when you become fluent in your craft, you don't try to compose, you just either do it or you don't, right? It's, it's when, you, when you get to the point where you're fluent, it's almost as if you're basically just waiting and not willing. You see, com mm -hmm. co composition for me now at the age of 64, is not an act of will. It's an act of surrender. It's an act of emptying myself. Then what tends to happen in the waiting and receiving is I hear something in that still place, in that empty place where the blackboard has been erased, where I haven't figured out anything, where I become an idiot all over again, right? Yeah. I, I end up hearing something that ends up being... Um, real to me wow so homeward implies that we're coming back to the best part of ourselves to the deepest part of ourselves to what lincoln would refer to as the better angels of our nature it's going to that place where there where there are no laws that we're obeying it's about a law it's about the law that it that is inscribed in every human heart mm. it is about the need for healing in that particular way. To, to kind of wrap up, you had said in your wonderful program note, if, if you don't mind me just quoting it, you said that really this quintet reflects um, the great mystery of life, um, that in order for something to of value to live, something else must die. 
And in the end, we have to you know, embrace life with its joys and its sorrows. That's part of the package. It's all in there. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And I believe that in, to the core of my being, what you just said, 